more meat, more fat. These are very good for the brain, especially the cortex primarily runs on ketones. And so if you have ketones and you have blood sugar available, your brain, the cortex anyway, only runs on ketones. Even if there's glucose available, it says, no, we want the ketones, right? So that's a preference. That's your primary energy source or ketones for your cortex. And that's the thinky, thinky part of the brain. It's only when the ketones start going down that you start adding in some glucose for that part of the brain because you have to, you need energy for your brain, but that's a secondary energy source. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Sorry, um, a bit, a, a bit uh, 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 late on the the arrival time. Sorry, I was just finishing up uh, with a Patreon group, which is actually a lot of fun. So on when, on Wednesdays for me, there's Tuesdays for uh, America. We we have sort of like an open chat on Zoom where everyone just sort of hangs out and talks about you know anything that's uh, topical or whatever people feel like. So we were just doing that. So thank you everyone for being patient. Um, good to see you all. Thank you very much for all the, the moderators and everyone that um, uh, has joined in. It's good to see all of you. I have about an uh, hour and a half, max two hours um, that uh, I'll be able to talk to you. And then I've got a, a lot of uh, other interviews and work and stuff like that today. And remember that the uh, Regenerate uh, conference, the health summit over in Melbourne is going to be April 21st next month. There are still tickets available, but they are, uh, going quickly, which is great. And so if people want to, um, still come to that, then, you know, please do get on that before tickets are unavailable. And then the, um, the PHC UK conference. So the public health collaboration in the, in London will be the 18th through the 20th in um of may and so that uh, can be checked out those links that are up on the screen there as well i believe um, my debate is going to be on the third day the last day uh, just because there's been some issues with people being able to get on and uh, so i think they switched changed the day so i'll be there or my debate on uh, the longevity side of things for uh, meat and is meat good for longevity that will be on uh, the last day, I think. So the final day, uh, if people are interested in just going for one of those days. Okay, so there's a, um, looks like there's a JX who had a question, said, uh, Dr. Chafee, what are your thoughts on men retaining semen and does sperm really get reabsorbed into the brain for vital and nutrients? Do you believe in the health benefits? I've, it's not something I've ever looked into. I think uh, semen retention, I think that's when you bring yourself close to uh, climax and then you stop yourself and then, um, and then I don't know, someone, they, they, I guess they've made some sort of health claims for that. I don't even actually know all the health claims that people are, are, are suggesting. Um, when I was in school, that was called blue balls and that was a negative. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's not it's being crass, but that's just the, the only thing I think of when people say that. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I haven't looked into that. I, I couldn't imagine that it would be, uh, all that beneficial. Honestly, I don't know why it would be. Um, you know, if you're getting a bit of those nutrients from semen, you know, it's, uh, it's not all that much, you know, you just have a piece of steak and you're going to get everything that, that would have been in there. So I don't know if it's going to be, um, more uh, beneficial and I, I would, I would doubt it, you know, I don't, I don't see why it would, but, uh, I haven't, it's not something to, you know, that I have actually looked into specifically myself or seen what the evidence is. I would imagine that it's probably more of a, of a, of a hassle than it's worth. Uh, for the benefits. If you want those nutrients, you can just eat them. You know, that's, that's where you get your, your vital nutrients from, not from your own creation. Uh, that's, that's what I would say. Uh, DP, thank you for the super chat. Um, hi, hi doctor, female carnivore for two months. Blood results are LDL, um, 571, HDL 74, triglycerides 108, 
high sensitivity CRP 3.9 and vitamin D25 is uh, 59 nanograms per milliliter, ALT 15, AST 23. And I'm concerned with the uh, high sensitivity CRP. Uh, what do you think? Should I repeat it soon? Well, look, it's not, it's, it's a bit up, but it's not all that far up. You know, you want it sort of below two, below one is ideal for high sensitivity CRP. Um, but you don't, you don't know what the trend is. It's, it's very important to understand what the trend is. If you're going to, if you're going up or you're going down or staying the same and all these other sorts of things. So it, um, yeah, it is something you should check again, keep going carnivore, keep, uh, reducing stress, improve sleep and, uh, do all these other sort of healthy things. And if you do that and you're eating properly and you're not drinking alcohol or having sugar or any of these other sorts of things that should come down and that should continue to come down. And then you just check that again you know, in a month or two, you know, maybe six to eight weeks, you check it again, see what's going on. I don't really, uh, I don't really think that, that checking cholesterol and all that sort of stuff is a, is a worthwhile endeavor. I think it's a waste of time and money because it's not, it doesn't tell us what we've been told it tells us. Um, you can look at it for, you know, improvements in metabolic syndrome or metabolic issues, such as, you know, your HDL and triglycerides and that ratio. Uh, and if your LDL is high and your total cholesterol is high, statistically, you're going to live longer. That's basically what that's all it's going to tell you. I don't think it's really necessary to get a cholesterol test to learn that. You can you can uh, find those sorts of things out in other ways. But it's certainly not a, an indication of heart disease. You know, we know that that's a, that was a scapegoat by the sugar companies. So that's not uh, that's not anything that I I tend to. To, to order for myself or my patients unless they specifically ask for it. Um, your vitamin D is a bit low, I'd actually say. Um, so you actually want that higher than that. Usually you want that, um, you know, over 100, maybe even over 140 to 180 is a, is a better range for that. So a lot of people are pretty low on vitamin D. And so it's, uh, it's very common, especially when getting into a carnivore diet. You know, you haven't been getting you know, the right nutrients for a long time. So two months is still early days. That was probably lower than that before. And so I would, I uh, would think about, you know, adding in a uh, vitamin D3 because, you know, you'll get a lot of vitamin D3 from fatty meat and grass fed butter and things like that. Uh, fish, wild caught fish, all those sorts of things. Uh, but that's very low. That's actually quite low. Vitamin D is a hormone, you know, it is important, you know, as you want to get out in the sun, Vitamin D is made on the surface of your skin on the epithelium and, and in the epithelium, but also on the epithelium. And, uh, and it gets into the sebum and it can take hours and hours and hours to absorb back into your skin. So sometimes as long as 48 hours to get all of it in through your skin. And uh, but at, at least you want to leave it there for like six to eight hours. So you go out in the sun, you get hot and sweaty, and then you go back in and you wash, uh, you wash yourself in the shower, and you're just gonna wash off all that uh, vitamin D with your sebum. If you use soap, if you just sort of rinse off just to cool down and get the sweat off you, probably going to retain a lot of that. But um, just just remember that. There was a study back in 1927, we've known this, where they scraped off sebum off the skin and gave it to rats that had rickets, which is a vitamin D deficiency, and it cured their rickets. So like obviously there's vitamin D in your sebum on your skin, and it can take a long time for that to absorb. So just remember that it might be a good idea just to add in a bit of vitamin D for a couple months, just to bolster yourself up and get back into normal levels. And uh, yeah, and then just check your check your levels again, sort of six to eight weeks. You need to get multiple data points. Your blood tests are just a snapshot in time. It's not a it's not a graph. You want to see the graph. Is it going up? Is it going down? What is it doing? And so just check it again in, in six weeks. Keep doing what you're doing. And um, I'm sure it'll be fine. You're eating the right way. You know, you improve other things in the right way, get better sleep, uh, reduce stress and all these things. And you'll, you'll, you'll do great. Uh, C4 on, uh, has a question. My father has early Parkinson's and is severely addicted to sugar. Any tips or studies that might help, um, help open him to carnivore. He is very, very stubborn. Well, there are studies with ketogenic diets to show improvement in, uh, Parkinson's. And so that's obviously getting rid of sugar and getting rid of carbohydrates in general. And so that would be very beneficial to him to do that. Also studies showing that people with higher LDL cholesterol actually have lower rates of 
Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, they're protected from these, also autism. And um, and what else? There was another one too. Um, well, I think those are the main ones anyway, you know, the, you know, ketogenic diet, those sorts of approaches and having more meat, more fat. These are very good for the brain. The brain, especially the cortex primarily runs on ketones. And so if you have ketones and you have blood sugar available, your brain, the, the cortex anyway, only runs on ketones. Even if there's glucose available, it says, no, we want the ketones, right? So that's a preference. That's your primary energy source or ketones for your cortex. And that's the thinky, thinky part of the brain, right? Um, when you, It's only when ketones start going down that you start adding in some glucose for that part of the brain because you have to. You need energy for your brain, but that's a secondary energy source. And so if you have Parkinson's or any other sort of uh, you know, neurocognitive issue, you need to you need to give your brain the appropriate energy source. Also, ketones cross the blood brain barrier and reconstitute into fatty acids. And so these can be used as the building blocks and physical materials to rebuild and reconstruct the brain and keep it healthy, healthy and active, which is very important, uh, especially in, in cases of Parkinson's. Also, there are studies in Parkinson's where people um, well, they've actually found that lectins, these different plant toxins that are just absolutely destructive in your body, they can actually track up the vagus nerve and go up into the brain from the gut into the brain and damage the substantia nigra and uh, potentially be a contributing factor in the development of Parkinson's. And so uh, I think it was in the Netherlands, they did a study looking at 20, 25 years of people that got a vagotomy, which is severed the vagus nerve. They used to do this uh, because they thought it helped stop, um, the development of ulcers. You're missing out on a lot. I mean, that's your, your gut brain connection is the vagus nerve. And so you've, you've really done yourself a disservice by, by cutting that, but this is something they did for a while. So you had thousands of people that did this and they found that people that had the vagus nerve cut so that there was no physical conduit for lectins to get up into the brain. They, those people had 66% lower rates of of um, Parkinson's compared to the rest of the population. So it suggests that there are, you know, that, that these lectins and plant toxins are contributory anyway, and um, at least by that mechanism and possibly others as well. So eating the right thing is going to help clearly. Um, there are a lot of people that have been helping their Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and dementia by going on to a high fat meat based ketogenic diet. And always remember that ketogenic diets, when we talk about that, it just, it means low carb diet, no carb diet. That's really what it is. You're in a ketogenic metabolism where you have no carbohydrates, your insulin is low. So that's the whole idea. You want to get your insulin down to a normal level, then your body works in very important ways. Um, in, in it's optimal way because insulin, affects blood sugar, but it also affects over a hundred different mechanisms in your body. And so if your blood sugar goes up and then your insulin goes up to try to combat the blood sugar, it's going up and it's affecting everything else at that elevated level. If it's down here at around a five, most of the time, then it's affecting everything at a five. If you eat a bunch of sugar and carbs, it bops up to a 35. Now it's affecting everything at a 35 as well. Now everything's really out of balance. And then you can get uh, fasting, uh, insulin, uh, elevation. So it's called insulin resistance. So it starts going up to 12, 14, 15, 20. I had a gentleman that came into my office a couple of weeks ago and his fasting insulin was 72, which is the highest I've ever seen in my, in my career. Um, uh, albeit, you know, my career is not as long as other people's, but it's, uh, it's definitely massively elevated. And so that's affecting everything at a 72. And then he eats carbohydrates. It jumps up to what, 104? Like who knows? It's just it's going to be massively elevated. So that's obviously going to der derange a lot of these things. So you want to keep your insulin at a normal level because without that, it's, it's affecting everything else. One of the things people talk about, they need to fast for a long period of time, like at least 72 hours, because then you get real good autophagy and all that's really important to turn over these different internal organelles in the cell. And that, and that's really good for health. And that is good for health, but it's not the lack of food that's causing that. It's the lack of carbohydrates. It's the lack of insulin that is triggering that because elevated insulin decreases autophagy. It stops autophagy, right? Look it up. 
You know, it's all, that's one of the mechanisms uh, that insulin affects is that it decreases, higher insulin decreases autophagy, right? And so it's not fasting that's doing it. So, you know, Dr. David Sinclair and Dr. Peter Atia, you know, they're saying, oh, you need to fast for several days every, every three months. And this is really important to get this autophagy. If you just don't eat carbs, you're always, you're always uh, able to go through autophagy. Your body's always turning over these, uh, these, these uh, organelles and things like that in your cells. It's always doing that. It's not because you're starving yourself and your body's looking for pieces of nutrients. That's not what it's doing. It's just a normal process. It's normal housekeeping for your cells to turn over these, these organelles and, and make them run better and more efficiently. So all these things are, are uh, you know, study in the ketogenic diet and fasting. They find a lot of you know benefits and improvements with fasting and, and being in a ketogenic state. And so those ketogenic diets, the ketogenic diet is the most rigorously studied diet on earth has the most, it's really the only rigorously studied diet on earth. You know, these plant-based diets are all survey studies and they're all garbage. You know, they're comparing processed foods diet to eating more fruits and vegetables. It doesn't say anything about the inherent healthiness of those fruits and vegetables, just that people that eat more fruits and vegetables instead of processed food, and they also work out more and eat less sugar and drink less alcohol and higher socioeconomic status and less diabetes and all these other sorts of things that are confounding factors, part of this healthy user bias, they smoke less, all these sorts of things. Um, all that saying is that, you know, people that, that are trying to be healthy, eat more vegetables because they're told to. Right. And they do other things that they're told are healthy as well. And you're comparing this to a processed food diet. So that's not real. That's not a real study. That's not real science. You know, that's a survey and they're manipulating the data and they're using it to intentionally manipulate the data. But the ketogenic diet is actually rigorously studied. You have randomized controlled trials, interventional trials with specific endpoints that they find that the ketogenic diet is a very beneficial and healthy diet and one head to head against the DASH diet for instance, and uh, other diets as well. So very beneficial, but what is it? It just means lack of carbohydrates, right? Well, but what kind of, so you could do that with a vegetarian diet, but you'd have to eat a lot of plant oils, possibly in the form of, you know, seed oils and you're just drinking canola oil. I mean, you'd have to take a ton of, of um, uh, supplements, right? Because it's just nutritionally devoid, right? So they don't do that. So those ketogenic, the ketogenic diet is not just any ketogenic diet. The ones that are in these studies are animal diets. It's an animal-based diet. It's a high fat and high animal fat, high animal protein, high meat ketogenic diet. They replace carbohydrates with animal fat and animal protein. So that's the most rigorously studied diet on earth is a high fat meat-based ketogenic diet. And that's been shown to be the most efficacious diet in the world. So that's a carnivore diet with a side salad. That's the most rigorously studied diet on earth. So when people say, oh, there's no big studies or high level studies on a carnivore diet, bullshit, you know, because a carnivore diet is a subset of the ketogenic diet because it is a ketogenic diet. And that's what you replace this stuff with. You replace the carbs and the plant, you know, nutrients with meat. And then you might have some asparagus if you hate yourself and you want to ruin your, your day. Um, so you know, you can do that, but the main part of that meal there is the meat and the animal fat, right? And so that's what's, that's what's been studied the most. And so that's the thing with Parkinson uh, diet and Alzheimer's and autism and mental health issues is that these ketogenic diets have been shown to be the most efficacious diets and help in these, in these, um, treat in the treatment of these issues. And that's a meat-based diet. That's an animal-based diet with no carbs and no sugar. So a long-winded answer, but I think it's really important to start framing it that way, to start framing things like, no, actually the most heavily studied diet on earth is a ketogenic diet. And the ketogenic diet is an animal-based diet. It's a high-fat, meat-based diet. It's a whole food, meat-based diet. And the vegetarian diet has never won against a ketogenic diet, and it never will because it's, uh, because, well, it's that specific ketogenic diet anyway high fat animal based diet that is the most rigorously studied diet on earth and has been found to be the best diet on earth and i so it's just carnivore diet with a side salad and i i think if you get rid of that side salad and we do those studies again i think you'll find even better improvements as a result good luck to your to your dad
Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Behind. Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right, thanks guys. A Cedro channel, Chafee, you look 10 years younger today. <laughs> really, I just, I just literally just woke up, so I had like, I feel like, I feel like I have like bags under my eyes or something like that because I'm just uh, quite tired. But thank you, that's nice of you to say. Uh, Michelle G from X says, I'm relatively new to carnivore diet for two months. I'm peri uh, perimenopausal, struggling to lose weight. It Look, it just takes time. Um, so don't focus on, on your weight as much as if you focus on your health. So just focus on your health and how you're feeling. You know, this can help with perimenopausal symptoms. A lot of people that are actually postmenopausal come out of menopause and actually become fertile again and get their cycle again. So this can hopefully help you as well. Um, eat a lot of fat eat a lot of meat, stop eating when it stops tasting good, uh, but don't under eat. That's very important. The weight will come. You know, when I see patients in my, in my clinic, in my office, uh, you know, we do a whole battery of tests and there's, there can be a lot of reasons and a lot of different hormones like leptin and people have leptin resistance and insulin resistance and all these other sorts of things. And you look at these sorts of things, these things are elevated and maybe their thyroid is trashed because of their diet and their other, other sorts of things are out of balance um, nutritionally deficient and all these other sorts of things, these things need to correct and they take time, uh, but they will, you know, so that leptin comes down, that insulin comes down, thyroid gets better and all these things start improving. And eventually you start losing, you start losing fat, which is the important thing because you don't want to lose weight. You lose weight with Ozempic, but the weight you're losing is some fat, but it's also muscle and bone. They're losing lean body mass. In fact, they're losing a lot of lean body mass. You don't want to lose weight. You want to lose fat and you want to put on lean body mass. And that's another thing too, is that when you are eating a proper human diet, you're actually gonna be putting on muscle and bone, especially if you're exercising. And I encourage you to exercise, you high intensity anaerobic exercise, like sprinting, like resistance training. And that will help you with your hormones that will help you with your overall health and longevity and how you feel and will also help you with fat loss but it will make you put on muscle which will offset the weight that you're losing right so it's not about weight it's about body composition and um it's about body composition and it's about uh your health first and foremost so focus on your health and um and the weight will come it can take longer for other for some people depending on where you are metabolically, if your met metabolism is is trashed and depressed from years of, of uh, you know starvation diets and rabbit food diets and and yo yo diets and things like that, then you know it's going to take longer. Um, but eventually you'll get there, and it just it just can take a while. Sometimes it takes six months, a year, sometimes longer. Most of the time it happens before that, but it uh, it may not for you. So just be patient with it. Focus on your health. Get rid of everything besides fatty meat, salted taste, and water. Get rid of dairy, butter, little bit, adding butter onto fat if you need more, or adding butter onto meat is fine if you if you do well with it. Um, if you need to, uh, to get more fat is okay, but get rid of all the cheeses and the milks and the yogurts and, and all that sort of stuff. It's a big weight loss stall. It can cause compulsive eating and you can end up overeating. And um, uh, get rid of all artificial sweeteners, even from electrolytes and things like that and stevia and, and uh, erythritol they're they're classic weight loss stalls and they can screw with your insulin as well um and there's mixed studies on that and i've seen mixed results in people some studies say that you can get a uh, reactive hypoglycemia and that this can actually give an insulin response even though you're not getting in sugar that sweet taste triggers the insulin response in your body and then i see people with cgm they go yeah i, I have artificial sweeteners it does nothing it doesn't change my my blood sugar at all. And I have other people going like, wow, my C my glucose just goes crazy whenever I have these things. So it does, there does seem to be some, uh, some difference in people. Um, but just get, just, just stay away from it. You know, it's a, it's a classic weight loss stall. And, um, if you're just eating meat, 
fatty meat, you're eating enough and you're just drinking water and nothing else, your body's going to heal and you're going to get better and you're going to feel better and you will absolutely start losing fat eventually. But that the most important thing is your health. So just focus on that and you'll be fine. Um, Itasca Patriot. I uh, had a question here. It said, Doc, my husband has lost 80 pounds and recently his blood pressure is elevated and having headaches. Clean carnivore eating. Um, blood pressure is, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's the blood pressure, 173 over 95. Um, well, 80 pounds is fantastic. Blood pressure going up is a bit is a bit weird. So, I mean, the blood pressure can cause headaches, first of all, but also headaches can cause high blood pressure. If you're in a lot of pain, that can raise your blood pressure as well. One of the... One of the you know, first things you look at, you know, if a patient has high blood pressure and they had a blood pressure spike, you need to think, uh, are they in pain? Is this a surgical patient? Do they have enough painkillers, pain relief? You know, they're, oh my God, their, their blood pressure is high. It's like, have you, are they in pain? Yes, they're in a horrible amount of pain. Okay, address the pain. Are they still having high blood pressure? No, or or yes, maybe, and then go from there. Um, so, I mean, carnivore is not going to cause that, you know, carnivore, uh, most people actually find that they actually reduce their, their blood sugar, uh, blood pressure and blood sugar. And so it wouldn't be from that. And especially, you know, losing 80 pounds, um, you're going to significantly, uh, benefit your cardiovascular health and, and blood pressure from, uh, from where it was. So clean carnivore, absolutely nothing else. I'm taking your word on that. Um, it's not going to be from the carnivore side of things anyway. So definitely work with his doctor to see, uh, what else could be influencing him. Maybe possibly medication, uh, is triggering this off pain. If he's having headaches, is the pain causing the high blood pressure? If you get the pain of the headache under control, does the blood pressure come down uh, and vice versa? If the blood pressure comes down, does the headaches go away? So that's something that needs to be investigated as well. Sleep is very important. Stress levels are very important. Any sort of other exposures, maybe something's going on. If you have you know, mold in the house, all these other sorts of things, maybe these are affecting you as well. It's not going to be the carnivore though. Um, and this is, this is something that's come up out of nowhere. So it's important to work with his doctor as well to see what could be going on uh, that could be causing this and to investigate that and uh, get his pain under control, get his headaches under control, find out what's causing his headaches and, uh, and see how that affects his blood pressure. But until then, he may need to be on some blood pressure medication to keep that down because that's too high. You know, that's dangerous at that point. You can get a rupture in your brain or around your body. These little vessels is pop and you have a you know, big stroke and that's uh, obviously life-threatening. So uh, definitely important to get that blood pressure under control. So I'll go see his doctor as soon as you can. And if it gets above 180, you just go to the hospital. That's a hypertensive crisis. So, you know, uh, this is someone, yeah, you need to see his doctor, really. He just needs to go see a doctor straight away. So Zach Spooner says, I'm strict and I have, and I just have this like perpetual tension um, that is getting, that has gotten worse. Uh, high heart rate and tension in the throat been strict for 40 days now. Um... High heart rate. Um, so we need, we need to know what, how high is it above a hundred? If it is above a hundred, then you need to go get that checked out by your doctor. Get a you know ECG, EKG, and um, and get that checked out. Uh, tension in your throat is a bit strange. Some people do get a bit of reflux um, when going carnivore, which is strange because it, it normally resolves when people go that. Uh, one thing I just spoke to a colleague of mine. I came across this, um, that there's a medication called, uh, metoclopramide that, um, is used for other sorts of you know, GI issues. But one thing that it does, is it actually helps with this, the, the sphincter tone, uh, of the esophagus, uh, leading into your stomach. And so it can actually prevent a bit of reflux. So that might be something that, um, that could help you if, it, if your doctor thinks that it's a bit of reflux, as opposed to going on like a PPI or an antacid or something like that, you could think of something like metoclopramide uh, if your doctor thinks that might be, and that can help sh tighten up that sphincter uh, uh, leading into the, the stomach so it doesn't regurgitate up into your esophagus and cause sort of issues like that. Um, so if you're getting a hard, strong heartbeat like that, and it's just like noticeable in your ears, that's... that's um, fairly common. It doesn't happen to everybody, but it does happen 
where uh, it's just your heart is running on ketones now and that's its primary energy source is just beating very strong, but it shouldn't be over 100. If it's over 100, you need to get that checked out by the doctor and see what's going on. If it's like an irregular pattern, you also need to get that checked out. If it's just a bit stronger and harder and a bit faster than normal, but it's still under 100 and it's a normal rhythm, you know, I, I think that's just your body, you know, then it's often just your body uh, readjusting to uh, ketones, which is which is okay because your your body wants to run on ketones and it's just getting used to that as well. So uh, yeah, those are a couple ideas. Irene Fernandez, thank you for the super chat. It just looks like there's a um, question down here. So Irene asks, do you think CAC score is significant? My brother is 60 years old, has normal test results uh, across all tests with a CAC score of 1200. Does carnivore help reduce the CAC score? Uh, yes, I do think that that's significant. It's um, it's a calcification of of arterial plaques, um, and so that's uh, not something you want to be elevated. Anything over a hundred is is significant and increases your risk of of uh, you know heart attack and things like that. So he's got a CAC score of twelve hundred. I don't know if he's carnivore, um, but he should be. <laughs> Uh, one thing that, that you'll hear doctors say is that, you know, oh my gosh, your, your CAC score is elevated. You need to go on a statin. And, you know, if you have a, 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 a bacterial infection, you say, oh, my goodness, you have this bacterial infection. You need to go on an antibiotic. You have high blood pressure. You need to go on this antihypertensive. You have high blood sugar. You need to go on this diabetes medication. What does that mean? You think you're treating that thing, right? You're going to give this medication. It's going to get rid of the bacteria. You're going to give this medication. It's going to lower your blood pressure. You're going to give this medication. It's going to lower your blood sugar, right? And so, oh my gosh, you have a high CAC score. You need to go on a statin. The assumption is that's going to reduce the CAC score, but it doesn't. It actually makes it go up. So it's actually exactly the opposite. You know, it's like if you're giving, oh my gosh, your blood pressure is high. Here's this medication and uh, jacks your your blood pressure up another fifty points. Well, what is that? Oh, be, no, it's okay now because we did it, and then the medication uh, makes you strong, your heart strong. That's that's um, the 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 insanity of what they're saying with uh, with statins. And CAC score. They're saying that a CAC score is dangerous. Therefore, you need to be on a statin, which raises your CAC score. Oh, hold on a second. But I thought that was bad. Yeah, it is bad if you do it. But if we do it, then it's stabilizing the plaques and it makes it less likely to rupture. I'm like, okay, but isn't my body doing that anyway? Isn't that uh, isn't that good then that my CAC score is going up because it's stabilizing the plaque? Oh no, no, no. It's really it's really bad when your body does it. But it's but it's really good when our drugs do it. Makes no damn sense. I mean, these people are just talking out of their ass, really. And um, so, uh, yes, it is significant that your CAC score is up. Uh, can a carnivore diet uh, help reduce that? Uh, we don't have proof of that yet. We have better, um, uh, we have things like Dave Feldman's uh, lean mass hyperresponders studies where he has a high fat ketogenic diet, animal based diet, carnivore diet with a side salad um, study where people have you know, uh, these, these cholesterol and LDL scores that are traditionally thought of as elevated for an average of 4.7 years. And the actual trend is to actually reduce atherosclerosis, not increase. So they did not increase atherosclerosis. The trend was to reduce atherosclerosis. So, uh, and that's looking at actual total plaque burden, not just CAC score, right? So the CAC score just looks at the calcified plaque, but that doesn't say anything about soft plaque. Soft plaque doesn't show up on a CAC score. You need an angiogram to look at that and see how much actual blockage is, how, how much occlusion you have. So that's probably the next step for him. And um, the the you know we still are still waiting on data, but you know there are individuals who are yes reducing their CAC score and yes reducing their arterial plaque and yes we have things like the, the lean mass hyperresponders showing that that is the trend when people go keto carnivore and and go to a, a more animal-based approach with ketogenic uh, metabolism being in the mix that that does seem to be the trend so it's definitely what i would do um but remember that you know different things can raise the cac score so if he's going to be um if he's going to be um 
checking a CAC score again, you know, it could go up or down independent of the amount of total plaque burden because the soft plaque can, can come or go independent of the CAC score, right? So it's really an angiogram that he needs to sort of actually quantify the amount of plaque that's there. And, um, but yeah, you want that to go away. The, the, there's a, there is an interventional trial, an experimental trial that was shown to reverse atherosclerosis and that was meditation. So 40 minutes of meditation a day, um, ongoing, you reduce stress, you reduce cortisol. And that, that was actually shown to reverse, um, atherosclerosis. So that's what I would do. And I would do that mindful meditation. I would chill out. I would relax. I would um, not take medications that increase my CAC score. I would get onto a healthy human diet and I would um, start exercising appropriately for his uh, fitness and cardiovascular uh, level, you know, whatever, whatever he's capable of doing, but you can do a little bit more, a little bit more. You'll be able to do a lot, uh, a lot, uh, a lot more after that and good luck to him. Then you get test down the road. And just remember, these are always snapshots in time. So you need to get these things sort of every couple of years to sort of see what direction it's going. And the CAC score isn't indicative of total plaque burden. So just keep that in mind. Claudia VR says, I can't believe I got you live. I'm from Mexico. I start carnivore uh, beef, eggs, butter, water 34 days ago and haven't lost a pound. Um, I've had diarrhea since day one. I'm pre-diabetic. My glucose has dropped. Uh, my glucose from 172 to 98. Well, that's amazing. Uh, I have fatty liver, essential thrombocytosis, and hyperlipidemia. Uh, yeah, well, look, you don't worry about the about the weight loss. Like I said earlier, you know, it takes time. A lot of people are in different positions with different hormonal uh, health and all these sorts of things. So just um, just don't don't worry too much about that. Um, just give it time. Your your health is improving. And that's the important thing. Your diabetes is reversing. That's what's important. Um, if your blood sugar was 172, I'd say you're probably full on diabetic, not not a pre diabetic. Uh, but either way, you're not anymore, right? Because that's that's come right down. And so uh, that's fantastic. So diarrhea since day one. You know, it could be that you're eating more fat than your body needs, but it, it's more likely that you're still having something else in your diet, such as coffee tea, caffeine, artificial sweeteners like stevia or erythritol, monk fruit sugar, um, even magnesium, metformin, you're a diabetic and you probably are taking metformin, which can cause loose stools, especially when you get rid of all the fiber that used to be blocking up your bowels and now things are going to be moving too quickly and uh, and you'll get that. So just, just remember that, get rid of all these other things. Um, and if you have to keep taking metformin, then do, but just remember that it can cause loose stools. Uh, now that you're not eating fiber and to get rid of everything else that could be um, sort of, you know, affecting that as well. And good luck with it. And you're doing fantastic. The fatty liver will go away. The, the diabetes is already going away and uh, your health will continue to improve. And um, I, I wouldn't worry about the, the dyslipidemia because it's, um, it's not the cause of heart disease, you know, uh, sugar, processed food, seed oils, alcohol, smoking. Those are the ones that are stress. Those are the things that are, that are really contributory, but you know what? Four out of five men smoked in the early 1900s and 1800s. And we did not have the heart disease rates we have now. More people drank as well and, um, did not have the, these heart disease problems. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of stress, very stressful, you know, you're working in the bottom of a coal mine and all these sorts of things and life was hell and there's wars and famines and all these sorts of things. There's a lot of stress back then too. And yet heart disease didn't start taking off until we started adding in all these seed oil, sugars and processed grains. So, you know, uh, I think I know where my money is on that one anyway. Revival Fitness, thank you very much for the super chat. Every mainstream source says omega-6 fats are essential. You may mention omega-3, EPA, and DHA often. What's your take on the types of omega-6s? Yeah, good question. There are omega-6s that you need, such as arachidonic acid, but you get arachidonic acid from uh, meat and animal fat. Uh, then there's uh, linoleic acid, which is omega-6 that comes from plants that you can convert into arachidonic acid. 
um, but it's not essential because you get arachidonic acid from meat. So as long as you're getting enough arachidonic acid from meat, then you don't need it from uh, linoleic acid. You don't need to convert linoleic acid into arachidonic acid. And the linoleic acid is it's quite pro-inflammatory. Uh, Professor George Ede from Harvard, a uh, um, uh, psychiatrist from Harvard, wrote a book called uh, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind. She says you can go keto, carnivore, and this is the best treatment for uh, mental health issues, such as major depression, schizophrenia, all these other sorts of things, autism, uh, ADHD, all these sorts of things helps a lot. And, um, and better than conventional treatment, far better than conventional treatments. And she is very opposed to linoleic acid. She says, this stuff is not essential. It's the rachidonic acid you want. You get that from meat. You don't need any of this stuff. And, and the linoleic acid is, is expressly toxic to the brain. Uh, your brain tries to use this energy. It can't use it as a building block and a structural uh, component um, like it does with DHA and EPA. And it tries to break it down for energy and turns into very uh, highly oxidative, free radical ridden nastiness. And that can really damage your brain. Um, Dr. Chris uh, Kenobi is very much against the omega-6s. Yes, you need some of these things, but it's a very small amount of, of arachidonic acid. And after that, it's 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 bad, and then you get a lot, a lot of linoleic acid, which you just don't need, need in the first place, and uh, and that can cause a lot of harm. And he looks at different populations around the world, native populations and others that have uh, different levels of linoleic acid and and omega omega sixes. And basically, if you keep it below one two percent of your caloric intake of these linoleic acid omega sixes, uh, those are the healthiest people. Even if they're eating a carnivore diet or high saturated fat diet, or even even a carbohydrate or, or even more carbohydrates, such as you know people eating like yams in Papua New Guinea and things like that, and eating eating some meat, but eating uh, you know more yams because that's what they have access to because they're poor. Um, but they're they're lean and they're healthy and they um, you know they do have you know some chronic disease issues, but they don't have this. They're not plagued with the the issues that we have in the, in the Western world. So you know he's he's a very big. Uh, proponent of, of keeping those the hell out of your diet past one to two percent so you need arachidonic acid you don't need linoleic acid is the is the take home from there and and too much of either is harmful lewis boyd thank you for the super chat having stents and four years later a stroke is carnivore diet for those um that had these problems my doctor wants to of course go the statin route well, you know, the advice your doctor has been giving you has gotten you to the position that you are now. And so that's not his fault. He's just doing what his overlords have told him and taught him to do, which were my overlords do at one point until I, you know, sort of shuck the shackles of um, living inside the box of contained human knowledge and actually started thinking for myself and started seeing that, um, you know, what was spoon fed to us in medical school and residency from the sugar, from the, the, the food and drug companies is not the uh, not the, the the way to the road to proper health. Um, I absolutely think that it's a great idea to go on a carnivore diet for everyone. You know, I, all human beings should be eating an optimal diet for human beings, and I think that all the best evidence shows that that's a high fat carnivore diet. As far as cardiovascular disease. Uh, the Journal of the American College of Cardi Cardiology published in 2020 a massive meta-analysis and, and uh, statistical review looking uh, or systematic review looking at all the best levels of evidence, all the best RCTs and meta-analyses of RCTs, RCTs and things like that, looking at the connection between um, saturated fat and cardiovascular disease. And they found no connection whatsoever, no association at all between uh, increased saturated fat intake and uh, the development of cardiovascular disease, none. And in fact, they found an inverse relationship between saturated fat and stroke. So they found that the more saturated fat people were eating, the less strokes they were having. And the less saturated fat they were eating, the more strokes they were having. So um, we have just been lied to. The first heart attack in America Death from heart attack diagnosed on autopsy in America was in 1912. I'll say that again, 1912. There was not a single death from heart attack recorded in the literature in America or the colonies preceding it at all. None. 
It was 1912 was the first one. They didn't believe him. They thought he was, he got it wrong. He just said, look, we've all, we've all been doing autopsies our whole life in our career. We're not seeing these things. We've never seen these thrown by, you know, in, in the coronary vessels. We have all these other pathologies and problems going on in the heart. And we've never seen that. No one ever sees that. You got it wrong. 10 years later, more of these are starting to show up. And they're like, oh, okay. It looks like, it looks like there's something new on the horizon. 10 years later, it's the number one killer in America, right? So it went from one single case that no one thought was accurate to 20 years later, it's the number one killer in America. During that time, the 1920s and 30s, we're eating the least amount of meat in 200 years in America, right? We're eating far more meat in the 1800s than we were in the 1920s and 30s, right? So why wasn't there a single reported case of a heart attack in 130 years before that? Right, actually more than that, you know, in, in hundreds and hundreds of years before that, when we're eating more meat than in the 1920s, right? Doesn't make sense. Um, there are a few scattered case reports, and I mean a few, like less than 10 scattered case reports around all of Europe throughout the entire century of the 1800s of people dying from a uh, heart attack, myocardial infarction. And I've, I've heard of literally one case report presented at a conference in the 1700s of uh, this thrombus in the coronary vessel going, hmm, isn't that interesting? That's weird. No one's seen that before. Hmm, isn't that strange? Right. So we could see this. People were seeing it when it came up. It just didn't come up because it wasn't happening. So if this was the number one killer in the world and this was just, it was just dropping like flies, you know, people had, I mean, you read the textbook, medical textbook from the 1800s, very detailed. You know, I have, I have Dr. William Osler's uh, textbook from the 1800s. It was my great, uh, my great grandfather. And who was a doctor? He's the, to date the youngest, still to date the youngest ever graduate from Columbia Medical School. He's twenty years old when he graduated, and he wasn't even able to practice medicine. He was like the original Doogie Howser. He had to go home and and sit at home for a year uh, before he was twenty one because in New York you weren't allowed to start your residency until you were twenty one. Then he did his surgical residency at Bellevue Hospital, and uh, and was a you know was a, a, was a very uh, you know well thought of surgeon uh, since then, and. Um, he, I have his textbook from William Osler, and it is very detailed. It doesn't say a single thing about, about um, heart disease and, um, and thrombus in the heart. They have all these detailed dissections, and these are all the things that go wrong, wrong with the heart, and this is what it looks like on, on dissection. Nothing about you know, things going wrong in the coronary vessels, and nothing describing the symptoms that you'd get that someone would get when they dropped dead of a heart attack. You know, we do have 4,000 years ago in the Ebers papyrus in e ancient Egypt when they were eating a bunch of grain, like lots of grains and pressed seed oils and a lot of alcohol, beer. Um, they actually described the symptoms that you would get before someone would drop dead of a heart attack. They described diabetes. They described Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's was first described and presented at a case, at a, as a case report, a single case report of an old lady who had neurocognitive decline presented by Dr. Alzheimer's at a, at a um, neurology um, conference in 1906, right? It's the first one. There's in a single case report before 1906 of anybody having similar symptoms of dementia. None. Not, not until you go back to the Ebers papyrus, right? That's nuts. Oh, people just weren't living long enough. Bullshit. You know, you have the average life expectancy from birth was low. That's because three out of five kids were dying in infancy. Of course, the average life expectancy was low. But you look at this, the, the census data from the 1800s in America, which, which I have, and it goes by decade because they weren't stupid like the people trying to make that argument. From birth, the average life expectancy from, uh, from birth in 1850s uh, was uh, like 38 years. But if you made it to 10, it was 56 years. If you made it to 20, it was longer than that and longer than that and longer than that, right? So if you got to adulthood, you actually lived to be a great age. And um, and then, you know, you started to get to the point where you got rid of these infant mortality rates. You started getting more potable water. We understood about microbes and infections and all these sorts of things. And that's what dramatically jumped up the um, the life expectancy was because we got rid of these these major causes of childhood disease and death. And then that made people survive those those um, sort of, you know, watershed moments and got past that. And then you, you just live a normal life unless you're killed in a war or something like that. So people have died of old age, actually lived very, very long time. They did not get Alzheimer's. They did not get dementia. They did not get heart disease. So yes, this is a very good diet for you, uh, especially for you because, um, you know, you don't have, you don't have room to play around, you know, and um, 
So, you know, I've seen some, some absolute idiots uh, who call themselves cardiologists who say that, uh, oh, when statins came in, we started treating um, cholesterol, um, the uh, life expectancy in humans went up by 50 years. And like, uh, these people are just flat out liars. They're absolute flat out liars. That did not happen. The life expectancy from the 70s to today is pretty damn similar from birth and otherwise, right? And um, it was in the early 20th century and late 1800s, early 20th century that you started seeing this massive increase in life expectancy from birth because of those infant mortality rates and getting potable water and not getting sick from all that sort of stuff. So, you know, uh, don't don't listen to, to idiots. They don't ever have anything good to say. Uh, Ruth Johnson says or asks, diagnosed with brain tumor on the right side, 11th or 21st of November, um, 23. I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, went full on carnivore, loving it. So four months in now, great. Um, had a follow-up MRI a week ago. Tumor is shrinking, but a lesion is showing up in the left brain. Well, first of all, amazing. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic that the tumor is shrinking. Look, depending, depending on the type of tumor you have, you know, if it's something like a GBM, which is the most common cause, or the most common um, type of primary brain tumor, and it's also the most aggressive. Uh, just just understand this. Like even when we, you know, it's not it's not like a, like a melanoma where you, you sort of have this thing right here, or and you you take it all out. If it hasn't spread, that's it. That's complete cure. It's done. Right. GBM seems to be a bit more of a disease process that's going on throughout your brain, or it may spread very quickly and and be all over the place, but. We've, we've seen where we've had, you know, sort of a right frontal lobe. You can just take that whole lobe out, right? If you're a melanoma, you can take a big, long, wide chunk out, right? You, you can just cut off your arm if you need to. And you can just, okay, that's, there's no more of that anywhere else. And it's not going to spread or anything like that if you get it early enough, right? And that's a compl complete cure. Those cancer cells are gone, right? You can get another one, but those ones are gone. Doesn't seem to be the case with, with GBM. So, you know, you can't, and you can't really do that. You know, if you have like a different part of the brain, you can't, you can just sort of, you know, get what you know to be tumor and you just, and you, and you're going to have to take brain with that, but you, you try not to take any healthy brain without GBM in it, but you're going to leave some of these things, which is why they then do chemo and radiation. That's the idea. But if you're like in the right frontal lobe, you can just take that whole thing out. You do a lobectomy, you just take, cut the whole thing out. Now you've got big margins. You've got this, you know, this tumor in here and you've got this big wide margin around that. And it still comes back. They've done hemispherectomies, the entire hemisphere, and just take out all that stuff and it just shows up on the other side, right? So there's some sort of disease process going on, right? Or this stuff is just sort of has tendrils everywhere and, you know, it's going to show up. So that's, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sorry to hear that, um, but it is, it is not uncommon. You know, that is, that is, uh, that is sort of what happens with GBM, but you're doing what I would do you know, which is, which is just going full carnivore. I would look up the PKD, the, the, the um, Sophia Clemens. I had her on my podcast. She is from Paleo Medicina, who's, um, uh, is a, is a treatment group in Hungary and they do basically restricted eating. You're not eating until fatty meat stops tasting good. You're eating less than that. And you're adding in organs because you're not eating as much food. So you need more nutrient density. And they don't, they don't fast much, but they do limit the amount of food that you take in. It is a very limited amount because you're trying to starve out this cancer. You're trying to keep your GKI low. You keep your blood sugar low and your ketones high. And that's been shown to uh, get uh, better results with cancer. There are, you know, over a dozen studies with GBM specifically in humans and hundreds and, and well, dozens anyway in animals and hundreds and hundreds and in other cancers in, in both human and animal trials showing the efficacy and benefit of ketogenic metabolic therapy for cancer. But specifically GBM, you know, they're smaller studies, but the, they do show benefit. And certainly in animal studies, they show benefit. GBM runs um, primarily on glutamine though. And so you're going to get that no matter what you do, because the glutamine in meat, there's glutamine in plants, and there's also you also make it, right? You make glucose too. It's just that you're trying to keep these levels down. So you make make some of it, but you're not spiking it up by eating a whole bunch on top of that. That's the idea. Um, so I I think there might be an advantage to periods of fasting 
with a GBM specifically because you are now not taking in any more glutamine. Um, you know, talking to Professor Seafried, you know, he who's, who's the main researcher on GBM and, and ketogenic metabolic therapy. Um, he is, um, uh, I've, well, I've, I've sort of heard through the great friends. I've spoken to people that he has spoken to and they've said that he's said, so I haven't heard it directly from him. So I want people to understand that, that I don't, I don't want this to be a game of telephone that, that gets misunderstood, but at a period of time of fasting, it actually does uh, help with your body's regulation of glutamine. And, uh, what, what they were saying was that, um, between an eight and 14 day fast was a good period to affect the glutamine and, and to limit the amount of glutamine that um, is available for the cancer to make energy. And then there's things uh, that can interrupt glutamine metabolism, such as Dawn. Um, and uh, I can't quite remember the um, chemical name for that at the moment, but if I, if I remember it, I'll, I'll say it. But it's certainly, I mean, you can watch it in our interview, my interview with Professor Thomas Seafried, S-E-Y-F-R-I-E-D. And the substance is D-O-N, it stands for, you know, deoxy, something um and um but you can you can take a look at that but either way it's not it's not really it's not really um it's not really something that uh you can get access to um it is something that uh some cancers are licensed for like leukemias and um so you may get lucky. You may get an oncologist that would, would give it to you. There's other other things that have been used in some of these trials um, that that are used for other things like antiparasitics, such as uh, fenbendazole and medbendazole. And this is something that Seafried is, is publishing on. These things can interrupt glutamine metabolism. Um, and so they, they have been used... Um, I think they've been using animal models, but I'm not sure. But anyway, they interrupt glutamine metabolism. It's something that, that Dr. Seafried is, is, um, is publishing on. There's a, there's a big paper coming out with protocols talking about how to use these sorts of things and discusses fenbendazole and mebendazole in there. That's something that is off-label. You'd have to talk to your doctor about that, see if that's appropriate for you. If that's something that's going to interfere with medications that you're on or... Um, or if uh, you know that the, you know if your particular uh, circumstance would benefit from that or not, um, but a big thing is keeping that blood sugar down, keeping that GKI down, the glucose ketone index down below two. That's a therapeutic level below two, below one if possible, through a combination of a high fat restricted uh, carnivore diet, like they do at Paleo Medicina. So you're eating less than you maybe want to. And, um, and periods of fasting potentially as well. You need to be careful with fasting and restrictive eating because you don't want to lose too much weight. If you start getting too skinny and you start, you know, getting, you know, uh, too low of a body fat percentage, you need refeeding days. So you need to have a period of time where you sort of refeed and you, and you bulk back up so that you're not, you're not uh, hurting yourself with that too. So good luck with that. Keep an eye on it. It's not the end of the world that little spot showed up on the other side. You know, it's um, good news is it's starting to shrink on that side too. I would be very aggressive with um, with this, and I would sort of throw the kitchen sink at it if it were me. And um, those are some of the things you do. But watch my interview with Professor Thomas Seafried and wait for that publication. It should be coming out um, in the next few months. Anyway, we we sort of sent it for submission. We they have. I'm I'm like. 37th author or something on there. So, um, you know, my contribution is, is, uh, really insignificant, but, uh, you know, professor Seafried and his, and his team are, have done an excellent job. It's, it's a fantastic paper and, uh, very long and detailed. And so hopefully that will be picked up by, uh, um, by one of the major groups and, and, uh, published soon. And people can take a look at that as well. Good luck with that. I, I really hope you do well. Um, really be aggressive with this. You know, it's, it, there's no room for error with this one. Um, there are no cheat days, you know, you're only cheating yourself. And any, anytime you eat anything off plan, you are feeding that tumor. And I would just be like, that's just poison to me. I'm not, I'm not touching any of it. You know, you need to be really dialed in. And there are people that are doing very, very well 10 years after their diagnosis and, uh, with, with shrunken or no sign of disease. And so, um, 
that can be you hopefully too. So good luck with that and be very, very switched on and dialed on to this and um, you'll do better when you do. Good luck. Um, also, there's a, there's a group out of, um, I don't know where you're located, but um, there's a Dr. Hugh H.U., who is doing a, a trial on GBM with ketogenic metabolic therapy out of Cedar sinai Hospital Medical Center uh, in America. So you might be able to get on, on board with them and get as part of that trial. And that could not only help you, but it could help um, you know, bring this uh, information to more people. They're trying to like a, a phase two trial where they're getting like 120 plus people. So if you're able to do that, um, you know, please do. And um, that could be mutually beneficial to both of you. Heather Crawford. Hi, Dr. Chafee. Thanks for all you do. And thank you for saving my life. Well, that, thank you. That's very sweet of you to say. And um, that's very nice of you to say that. And I'm, uh, well, I'm just very glad that this information is, is being able to get out there and, and help people because it's uh, certainly helped me and it certainly helps my family and uh, my patients. And so I just want, just want people to be healthy and happy and uh, not need to rely on medications and doctors just to have normal damn health. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You know, we just, you have a disease, uh, horrible disease or disaster or an accident. That's what the medical establishment is supposed to be for. But now it's just like, you just, you're just falling apart unless you're on constant medication. That's just obviously not the way it's supposed to be. The, the normal state of humanity of all life on earth, plants and animals, bacteria and otherwise is one of health. We're all supposed to be healthy. We're not going to just be these sickly dying diseased creatures. We wouldn't make it. You would not make it. We would never have been successful in uh, in the world uh, to get to the point that we are now. So uh, obviously something has gone very wrong, and I obviously think that it's the food. And so uh, I'm glad that you came around it and, um, and that it's helped. AGK, thank you for the super chat. Hi, doctor. I am a track athlete and I've seen your videos with Ryan Talbot. How much worse is keto diet than carnivore diet? Uh, what benefits wouldn't you find? Oh gosh. So it, well, it depends on the kind of ketogenic diet you do. If you're doing that, those sort of like uh, processed food keto diet, we're using artificial sweeteners. It's garbage. It's complete crap. I wouldn't do that at all. It's not going to be very good at all. The only good thing about it is you're going to be eating more meat right? You can still get an insulin response and, and uh, screw up your energy levels and things like that. Depends on how much plants you're eating too. You know, a lot of people, when they do keto, they're just eating tons of plants and veggies because that's where all the nutrients are. No, that's where all the poison is. All the nutrients are in the meat and in the fat. And so it, it depends. It depends on the kind of keto diet you, you do. But I'll tell you this, I'll tell you my own experience with this, which is I was already doing a ketogenic diet. I was, I was back from Bangladesh doing uh, humanitarian work there and I was, you know, fat and out of shape. And I mean, I wasn't like obese or anything. Well, technically was because of my BMI, but, um, you know, I just, I've always been, I'm right now I'm, I'm obese according to the BMI. So, um, you know, then I was, I had, you know, excess fat. I wasn't, you know, extremely big. I could still, you could still sort of see the, the, the hints of my six pack, but, uh, I was very out of shape, you know, especially for me because I'm, I've, I've normally been in very good shape my whole life, uh, just because of how active I've been. And so I, was already doing keto. I just gravitated away from carbohydrates because anything containing carbs uh, made my back hurt for days. And it's just like my lower back, I had really bad lower back pain. I was like, okay, well, I don't want that. And so I just stayed away from it. And then my lower back pain was gone. Great. So I was just eating greens like um, and clean, real clean. I wasn't doing keto. I was just not eating carbs. And I always ate clean. I never ate processed carbs, never had artificial sweeteners. I just thought they tasted gross. And I was never convinced that there were anything but harmful. And um, just eating spinach, kale, and broccoli, and then lean meat and not all that much of it, right? Because I was trying to slim down and get healthy and get back to playing rugby. And I felt like garbage. I had terrible energy. I wasn't losing weight. I was lifting weights every day, but you know, wasn't wasn't feeling great doing it. I um, was just sort of tired all the time, hungry all the time, and um, you know, I was just like, oof, not ready, not ready to go back and start playing rugby. I'm going to need to, you know, try to get into a bit better shape, and then and then see if I can do it. Obviously, the thing to do to get in shape would be to go back and play rugby, but that's you know another story. Um, but you know, mentally, I wasn't there. I was like, I didn't think that I could do it yet. And then I just dropped the spinach, kale, and broccoli because I was like, right, I, you know, plants are toxic. We're carnivores. We're not supposed to eat this crap. Got rid of them. 
And, um, and then I just started eating a lot more meat and it was night and day. My, my life changed overnight. Within two weeks, I lost 23 pounds. And I started shredding fat and stacking on muscle. And I felt like a superhero. I could work out for hours and hours and hours and hours and never run out of energy. And I never got sore. And I put that to the test. I did 32 sets of heavy legs and I couldn't get, I didn't even wear myself out. I just had to stop because I've been there for four hours. I'm like, I got, I've got things to do. I've got to stop this. This is not, this is, I could just keep doing this all night. And I wasn't sore the next day or the day after that. And then I had one cup of black coffee and I was sore for two days. Right. So I was just like, right. Plants are toxic. I'm not touching any of these damn things. And um, and that was, that was it. After I did that 32 sets of, of legs and I didn't, wasn't sore the next day, I'm like, yep, time to go back to play some rugby. And I was back and I was at a dead sprint the whole time. And I was just like, well, what should I do? You know, should I ease into this? And I was like, no, screw that. You know, when I was in between 20 and 25, I felt like a like a superhero. I was just a, I just felt like a like invincible. I never ran out of energy. I could just push myself at a dead sprint the whole time. And I never, never wore myself out. So I'm just going to do that now. I was doing carnivore then. I'm doing carnivore now. Let's just do it. I was at a dead sprint the whole time, keeping up halfway through the season. And I kept up with everybody um, that were professional athletes. This is, you know, my my team in Seattle had gone professional. It was, the, uh, it was already the top team in North, uh, one of the top teams in North America. We played in the top leagues in, in Canada. Uh, the Canadian Premiership and in America on the Super League and in uh, the you know Division One and things like that, and um, you know uh, now we're in the MLR. I'm one of the first two years of the MLR, right? So again, top team in North America, and I'm in a dead sprint keeping up with everybody, right? Halfway through the season, I haven't done anything in months. I hadn't played a full season in three years. Two weeks later, kept doing training. I'm still you know fat and out of shape. Um, but I felt like a, a million bucks. I felt at 38, I felt like I was 22 again. I just felt amazing. And then two weeks later, after, you know, sort of four training sessions, we did a, a um, fitness test called the modified bleep test. And people that played rugby and soccer probably been, had to suffer through this thing. It was a breeze. I finished like in the top five out of 92 people mid season. And I've been training for two weeks, but I've been carnivore for four weeks. And that was the difference. It was all diet. It was 100% diet and it was dropping damn vegetables. That's what did it. I was already not eating carbs. It was just vegetables and meat. And now I'm eating more meat and more fat and specifically. And I just dropped those damn toxic vegetables and it absolutely changed my life. So that is the difference between keto and carnivore. It makes a big difference. And you'll see a lot of people... Uh, look, keto is great, but carnivore is better. You know, you're getting, you're getting into the right metabolic state when you're on ketogen, on, on a ketogenic diet, you're eating more meat, you're eating more fat that those are all really good things. Right. But these plant toxins are, are no joke. You know, like, oh, well, dose makes the poison. Yeah. And the dose is really damn small. You know, uh, you can kill yourself. You can die from ingesting 50 to, uh, 300 milligrams of, uh, cyanide right? 0.5 milligrams per kilograms to like 1.5 milligram per kilogram of body weight, right? So a hundred kilo person can die from 50 milligrams of, um, of cyanide. Flaxseed, one serving of flaxseed can have as much as six milligrams of cyanide, right? And we're saying this is a good thing for people to eat. And a lot of, a lot of vegetarians and vegans eat, eat flaxseed because it has uh, omega threes, the wrong omega threes has ALA, not DHA or EPA. So that's useless for your brain. Um, it doesn't convert into DHA and EPA to any significant degree, if at all. And some have actually shown that you increase ALA and actually DHA goes down. So good job. Good job, vegans. And, um, but, uh, you know, it's not their fault. They've just been conned. It's, it's really the, the, the vegan influencers that are pushing this crap and pushing this information and more directing that at. But, um, you know, it's, um, they eat a lot of flaxseed because it has, it's high in ALA, right? So I say, oh, you need those omega-3s, so you eat that. And so they eat a lot of flaxseed, right? Okay, so, so 10 servings of flaxseed a day, which, you know, it's a lot, that can kill you, Right? So yeah, the dose is bloody ass small and that's a lethal dose, right? Long before you get to be a lethal dose, you get to, um, 
uh, you get, you know, sub sub lethal doses that are that are clinically significant that can cause harm and exposure to uh, cyanide can cause thyroid dysfunction, goiters and neurological damage. The CDC and the WHO say there is no safe amount of cyanide to eat. Right. You just don't eat any. Right. Why isn't that warning label on on packs of almonds and flaxseed and cassava and apples? right? Because the seeds have cyanide. So you get, you, there's a study actually that went to uh, smoothie shops around the US and just checked the, the cyanide content in the smoothies that they were selling. And they were like super high. Anything that had flaxseed, almond milk, and whole apples because it gets the seed in. They didn't core the apples. They didn't take the seed out. Oh, it's easier just to do it. Oh, who cares? Not that, it's not that bad. Dose makes the poison. If dose makes the poison, then you had better damn well know what that dose is. And if anybody ever tells you, well, dose makes a poison, say, okay, great. And what is the dose? If they can't say it, then you tell them to shut up. You know, they just, they, that's such a stupid statement. Dose makes the poison. Then what, yeah, what's the dose? I know the dose. Do you, you know? So yeah, it's, it's really damn small. So, um, People get a lot of benefit from this. You see people doing a ketogenic diet for years, maybe, and, they, and they're doing really well and they're really healthy. And then they go full carnivore and it's just like, whoa, I had no idea. I had no idea that I could feel this much better. So it makes a massive difference. It will make a massive difference in your athletic uh, career as well. And uh, I have absolutely no doubt of that. And um, uh, good luck with you. Good luck to you. Also, these, these hormonal disruptors, a lot of these things disrupt your hormones and um, they're going to screw up your testosterone. I, uh, Ryan jumped his testosterone from, from 760 to 1150. It, you know, and I think he tested it uh, a year later, right? I mean, that, I mean, how much of an how much of a, of a benefit is that as a, as a as a top tier athlete, and you just you know nearly double your testosterone levels? I mean, what the hell is that going to do to your performance? I mean, it's going to go, it's just going to go crazy, right? And so you know, and uh, and it has, and you have all these anti nutrients in plants as well, so you're not going to be able to absorb all the things properly out of your, out of your food. You're eating a salad with a steak. you that salad is going to make it so you don't absorb all the nutrients properly from the steak. And it's going to come with a bunch of, of, um, of oxalates and toxins and lectins and hormonal disruptors. So actually it makes a big difference between keto and carnivore. So, uh, you know, good, you know, good luck with that. I think you'll be very, 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 uh, pleasantly surprised, uh, at how much better you feel from going to keto to carnivore especially as an athlete. Hey everyone, if you need a little extra help getting started on a carnivore diet and my online resources that I have for free aren't enough for you, you can go to www.howtocarnivore.com and sign up for a 30 day carnivore challenge where you'll have online resources, group support, weekly Zoom meetings, as well as the ability to chat live with myself, Simon Lewis, and the others in the challenge who can help you and support you and give you extra advice and help you along the way. So if that sounds like something that would be beneficial to you, then please go to howtocarnivore.com and sign up. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you there. Zachary Scott, uh, thank you for the super chat. Fighting peripheral artery claudication. Well, Good luck to you in your fight. Um, hopefully that that uh, gets better, you know, so that's going to be caused from, you know, uh, peripheral vascular disease from getting uh, clots and things like that. Um, uh, and uh, and hopefully that that sort of opens up those those passageways and, and reduces the amount of. Um, of uh, stenosis that you have and you get more blood supply down so you don't get that claudication. So fingers crossed for you. Uh, you know, there are people reporting that they get improvements from that, but obviously this is just anecdotal, but, um, you know, that, that has been people's, uh, experiences so far. So hopefully those are yours as well. Um, it looks like, um, Melissa is saying that a lot of people are asking about if eggs and butter are okay on a lion diet. Uh, well, technically a lion diet does not include eggs. Um, butter usually pretty fine. Um, you know, just adding a bit of butter onto, onto that, but, you know, see how you feel, you know, if people have autoimmune issues, they might have to be a bit more careful, especially with things like butter and dairy. Uh, but most people do fine with butter. So just see how you go with it. Uh, I usually consider, um, I usually consider, uh, butter. Okay. Uh, with just, you know, beef and butter and things like that on a lion diet. 
um, not really eggs. Eggs wouldn't really be part of the lion diet. And um, the lion diet is more specifically for people that have that, that have to be a lot more strict, like with autoimmunity, and they tend to not do well with eggs. So, you know, and we sort of, you know, you know, arguing semantics here, but the line diet does refer to really just eating ruminant animal and, um, and water only. I think that butter is generally fine. Um, eggs won't be for people with autoimmune issues usually. So, but just whatever, whatever you feel works best for you is, is fine. Mary Shepard, thank you for the super chat. Um, B12 low, somewhat anemic. Uh, until I'm further into eating right with my carnivore diet, should I supplement? If so, with what? Um, well, it depends on how low your B12 is. I mean, there there are levels that, you know, if you're below a certain level, you can actually get demyelination of your axons. You can actually get nerve damage. And um, since your brain's made out of nerves, you get brain damage, right? So that's not uh, that's not what you want. So if your B12 levels are, are, are below sort of a critical point, I would absolutely advocate for you know taking uh, supplements under the tongue supplements or even getting an injection. Um, so I, I don't know where you are, um, but uh, I can give you some some readings that I would consider critically low. So for picomoles per liter, anything under 400, you can get demyelination of your axons, anything under 500, I probably would still uh, start with an injection and um, and then just start adding in liver and and red meat and things like that to get your B12 levels up. It could be that you have a, a, a you know, something like pernicious anemia, which is an autoimmune disease, which makes it so it's very difficult for you to absorb um, uh, B12 through your digestive tract and you may need it under the tongue or you may need in injections. And so if you are eating, if you get an injection and you're getting your levels up, and then you're eating, you know, meat and liver, and your levels are still coming down, 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 down. Then you need to be checked for your abs absorption issues as well, and you may need under the tongue sublingual B12 ongoing, uh, and then you know, maybe even injections. Um, and then in uh, so those are the numbers for that. So picomole per liter is the the units generally found in uh, Commonwealth countries, so like England and Australia, New Zealand. And probably Canada as well, um, I believe, but maybe not. Um, if not, then they'll be the same as the U.S. numbers. U.S. numbers are picograms per milliliter, so that's PG slash ML, and uh, under 540. Uh, that's uh, the equivalent to under 400 of, the, of, of picomoles per liter. So that's that's a critical, critically low. You know, really under anything under 600, 650, you should probably entertain uh getting an injection for that that's that's i would consider that critically low even though that's going to be like right in the center or even in the upper half of what the reference ranges are and that's just because everybody's low on b12 you know so everybody's deficient and um so that's what i would do so yeah if you're if you're way too low on some of these things then i would definitely recommend um then i would definitely recommend uh starting with that starting with a supplement to catch you up out of get you out of that critical state and then just eat meat a bit of liver kidney heart to sort of get you up that is a supplement uh in in uh, for carnivores because it's very nutrient dense and so that's what i would do uh, as well so it depends on how low your b12 is if you're low on the their scale you are freaking low and you need to get an injection right away it's not safe to go around with that because you're actually getting brain damage while you're doing that. So um, don't do that. Uh, there's a study out of Oxford in 2008. Uh, 2008. They looked at, uh, as part of the study, they looked at vegans after five years and they found that their brains actually shrank by over 5%. So, you know, oh, this is so healthy. You can just do this and it's it's perfectly good for you. No, it really isn't. And it's, uh, it's really bad for you and it's bad for your brain. And so they thought, now there's going to be a lot of things. They're not getting DHA, EPA, all these sorts of things, probably eating a ton of flaxseed and getting cyanide poisoning and damaging their, their body and their brains for that reason too. But they also have very low B12. Uh, and they said critically low B12. And they thought that that was the main reason because you can get demyelination of your axons and that can actually shrink the, the body of your of your brain and your, and your um, nerves. And we can actually see this in neurosurgery. People are vegans, vegetarians, their spinal cord thins out because of that demyelination from the lack of B12. And um, 
And, uh, and I've, I've spoken to other neurosurgeons about this as well, you know, um, that it's not just, uh, it's, that hasn't just been, you know, just one or two people that have observed that. That's like a common observation in neurosurgery. And um, so they thought it was because it was critically low B12 and the critically low B12, and this was in the UK, so it was in those UK numbers, was uh, you know anywhere from 180 to 190, which is well below that 400 level. But in the UK, the range is like 130 to 540, right? So they're like, oh yeah, no, that's, that's in that range. That's in that normal range. In Australia, it goes down to like 130. So 130 is normal. But these people had such critically low B12 that their brain shrank by 5%. Right. So that's that's a big deal. So if you're low for their scale, then you are even lower than that. And that can that can cause serious damage to your brain and to your to your nervous system. And so I would 100 uh, percent take supplements and get an injection if that were the case. Absolutely. 100 percent. So, um, yeah. Sounds like a good idea. All right. And then continue on with carnivore diet with liver. And, uh, and if you, if, and you may need a couple successive shots, you may need a shot every couple of weeks for a bit to get your, your numbers up. Um, you know, in Australia and UK, you want to be between sort of 800 and 1200. And, um, and, uh, And um, you want to be between sort of uh, 12, 800 and 1,200. And um, in American numbers, you want to be between sort of 1,100 and 1,600. That's ideal. Okay. So that's going to be way above their level. And your doctor's going to look at that and go, oh, your B12 is way too high. This is dangerous. No, actually, it's not. It's dangerous that you actually listen to those, those reference ranges that are just averages for the community as opposed to uh, the reference range for actual health. And unfortunately, most doctors don't even know that, which is scary uh, because – you imagine that imagine how much like that would revolutionize medicine just that not not even any of the diet stuff or anything like that just you use reference ranges that actually denoted good ranges for health right and just everyone comes back and their blood is just everything's red like oh my god oh god you know like you'd have to do dramatically different things uh, as a doctor to try to correct all these things you know as everything was going to be out everything is going to be out and so uh it would be uh that would be a big, big shakeup to the medical establishment if we just use reference ranges that equated to good ranges for health. So yeah, if your B12 is in the normal range, it's too low, basically, uh, for for um, the standard uh, average for the community. It's just way too low. Um, all right, everyone. I probably end the super chats there because I've got um, probably about twenty more minutes, and then I've got to go go to an interview and get ready and go to an interview. Um, but I'll get through as many of these as I can. So, uh, Orange Chick, thank you for the super chat question. Sixty-year-old male, keto for two weeks, then carnivore for three weeks. History of migraines with aura and frequent had severe migraines through the three of the last four days. Use LMNT. That's the electrolytes. And increasing salt and fat. Any other suggestions? Well, just make sure you get the element tea that doesn't have any uh, sweeteners and artificial flavorings. You just don't want any of those sorts of things. Um, and yeah, just make sure you're getting enough fat and uh, eating until fatty meat stops tasting good. Plenty of water. Um, migraines are you know very uh, easily triggered by dehydration, and uh, if you have high ketones and high water, then that should keep your migraines down. Uh, uh, less frequent and less severe as well. And that's pretty much it. So um, yeah, most people don't need a bunch of electrolytes. Some do, but uh, you definitely, no one needs electrolytes with stevia in it or erythritol or artificial flavorings or anything like that. So make sure you don't get any of those and, you know, just keep doing what you're doing, you know, your early days. And um, uh, I would, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that you got those sort of severe uh, headaches but just ramp up the the water ramp up the fat get rid of all artificial sweeteners and all that other stuff just fatty meat salted taste water that's it and uh and uh, you'll do better good luck with that oh uh, that zachary scott thank you for the super chat i think that was a sort of a repeat though um I'm a carnivore fighting arterial claudication, which is great. And good luck with that. 
Uh, Tyler, a wise guy, thank you for the super chat. Hi there. I've been on carnivore for 30 days and I feel great. I walk three miles every morning. Uh, some of my relatives say you can't be on this diet for the rest of your life, but I disagree. Well, one way or the other, you can. Yeah, whether it kills you or you just live longer than everybody else and you uh, and you go on until you die, you can definitely do it. So, um, yeah, one way or the other, you can definitely do this the rest of your life. Uh, but, yeah, no, of course, you know, people have been doing this forever. We've been doing this for millions of years. And this is not a crash diet. This is not just something to, you know, lose some weight and get into a smaller dress size or pants size. This is this is. This is eating for longevity. This is eating for long-term health and happiness and, um, and longevity. So this is, if you, any animal, if the animal eats what they're designed to eat, they're going to live uh, the way, as long as they're designed to live. And they're gonna be as healthy as they're, and they're gonna be as healthy as they possibly can be. And, uh, and if you don't do that, you will live a shorter life. I have never seen uh, any study with any animal ever where they've changed the diet from their optimal primary diet to something else and they've lived longer and had better health health benefits. The only, only argument you can make is if you put an herbivore on a, on a carnivore diet because that's what they need. They need meat and fat. They need, you know, protein and fat, right? And that's what they turn fiber into is protein and fat, right? And they turn that into their body, right? So, you know, um, you know, herbivores do opportunistically eat other animals if they can, right? And it's, it's pretty weird looking to see a horse, you know, munch up a little duckling or, or a little chick, right? It's pretty creepy. You're like, oh my God, that was, okay, that just happened. And, um, and uh, you know, but that does happen. I saw, I saw a uh, deer once eat a uh, rabbit, which is super creepy. Um, because it didn't have the right teeth to chew it. It was just, it took a long time and it was very odd. And, uh, it was, it was actually a video and there was like the, there was a doe eating it and the stag was there looking at it. He was sort of, he was shocked. His eyes were bugged out. He's looking at him going, like, it just didn't know, he didn't know how to handle this information that was going his head. It was like, what the hell is happening? What am I watching here? So, you know, I think that, you know, if you have an herbivore eating meat, yeah, you, might be better or at least the same but really anything else no so um this is how we're designed to eat this is what we're supposed to eat this is our most beneficial thing to eat that's all there is to it plants have toxins we're not supposed to eat them we don't detoxify them very well end of story meat you don't have to detoxify there's nothing toxic in it it only has nutrients that's it you know if you get a poison sack not the same thing that's not meat that's a poison sack right that's a defense the meat is not the defense right uh, but plants, it is. That's that's how they defend themselves. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you in disagreeing with your relatives. Titans play. Thank you very much for the super chat. Hard to build muscle on carnivore? Question mark. Was told exertion decoupling uh, from not having enough carbs was the reason. Oh, they're full of crap. No, you you just need to eat enough and you need to work out. So if you're if you're uh, <laughs> exertion decoupling, dear God, no. Um, absolutely not. So you just eat as much fatty meat as you're hungry for. You're going to, you're going to put on muscle easier than you ever have in your entire life. You need to eat enough though. So you have to find different ways, different times of getting food in that isn't going to interfere with your workouts. You need to have a good five hours between a meal and a, your workout, or you're not going to have as good of a workout. If you're eating during the day, you can't eat a big, large meal that, that stuffs you, right? Like you do at night. Um, but you need to eat enough, right? So you stuff yourself at night after your workouts and after you go home and then in the morning you might have, may be hungry again. You may need a little bit more, maybe a little more in the afternoon. Then you have your big workout. Then you eat again after that, right? So you, you at least eat twice a day and you make sure at least your evening meal, you eat until fatty meat stops tasting good. That's very important. If you're not eating enough, you won't have the building blocks of material to put on muscle. Um, can you bulk faster? Eating carbs, sure, but that's not muscle. Say, oh, well, yeah, you have to put on fat in order to put on muscle. Total bullshit. You're putting on fat. You're not putting on muscle. You you get intramuscular fat. You get intramuscular glycogen that pulls in two molecules of water with each one molecule of glycogen, right? So you're getting waterlogged muscles full of glycogen and water, and you're getting fat. It's called myosteatosis. Is something that Lane Norton does not understand. I, I did a post about this. Oh, what is this about? 
basic ass biology lane. I mean, figure it out. I mean, this guy, I think he's, he must be lying about his credentials because no one with a, with a degree in biochemistry should, should lack this basic understanding or at least be dumb enough to argue with a doctor who looks at MRIs on a daily basis and says, hey, we see myosteatosis. There's even a name for it. Uh, which is human marbling. You get this fat deposition in the muscles, and this is why, for the same reason that cows get human, that the cows get marbling, myosteatosis, because we give them a bunch of grains of sugar and alcohol. Same thing happens with us, and we see this on MRI, and so that's what's happening. You're bulking with a bunch of carbohydrates, and so sure, your your muscles are swelling up. You're getting fat, but your muscles look bigger. But then you go and you lean down and oh, all your muscles shrink down. So they say, oh, you have to put on fat to put on muscle and then you're going to lose muscle if you're going to lose fat. Total bullshit. You're not losing muscle and you're not putting on muscle. You're putting on fat, water, weight, and glycogen and you're losing fat, water, weight, and glycogen. That's all there is to it. The muscle was never there in the first place. It just looked like it was there, it looked bigger, but that wasn't, that wasn't muscle. That was garbage. And so if you're just eating meat you're only putting on lean body mass. You're not going to put on 30 pounds and then cut down 20 pounds to get 10 pounds of lean body mass. That's not how it works. Um, that's how it works with carbs. And so you might, it might look like you're gaining more, but it's, it's fool's gold. It's gone in the morning. Right? So it's, um, you know, no, that's total, total garbage. Just make sure you're eating enough and working out and you'll get, you'll build more muscle than you ever have in your life. Uh, Ryan Talbot was running into that. He was, he was sort of losing too much weight and he was just like, look, you got to eat more. You got to figure out when you can stack in your meals. Cause you're just training your ass off, you know, and you have to do this. Then he got to the point where he was eating enough and he said he, he had to actually pull back on his workouts because he was putting on too much muscle, right? Which is a pretty good problem to have for a scholarship, uh, athlete in college. Right? So you know, he's, uh, and he's, he's got invited to, to, uh, train, try out, uh, try out for the Olympics for the Olympic track and field team. So this is, this is a world-class athlete and that's what he, that's what he found. That's what I've found. And I, I've played at the highest levels of rugby as well. And those are my experiences. This is everyone's experiences. And that's the biochemistry and physiology of it. You just need to eat enough. So you do the workout and you, and you push yourself and you just need to eat enough. And so Ryan was actually pulling back on his workouts because he was getting too muscular. He was getting too big and too bulky. He's like, he had to keep his musculature down so that his, his strength to weight ratio was higher so he could go faster and, uh, and be more explosive, right? He didn't just want to be, a, you know, wasn't going for a bodybuilding competition, you know? Um, so uh, no, the gym bros are dead wrong on this one. Stags, thank you for the super chat. Uh, I want to lean up and lose body fat. I do five days of resistance training, one hour fasted walks and walks throughout the day. How low to reduce fat intake and kilocalories? Don't, don't reduce your fat intake. You'll actually stall your weight loss because you actually reduce your metabolism, right? So if you starve yourself, if you chronically limit the amount of food coming in, your body just says, oh, look, we're in a famine. Your body doesn't know you're trying to lose weight or lose body fat. It just knows your inputs. And no animal is not going to eat its requisite food, its, its uh, primary food if it's available and it's hungry. So your body's telling you to eat and you're not eating. So what does that tell your body? It tells your body that you don't have access to food, that you're in a famine. And you can't eat. So what does your body do? It lowers down your, your output. You know, calories in, calories out. Yeah, well, depending on what you do and how much you eat, you're going to reduce the calories out, right? So, you know, people that uh, don't understand biochemistry, like, you know, <laughs> Mr. De you know, bio, De you know, didn't study bio lane, um, uh, don't get that, you know, but you'll, you'll actually reduce your metabolism and you'll suppress your body's ability to, um, to burn fat and to, uh, to lose it. So you look at the biggest loser trials, they, uh, they had the people on the biggest loser on the show, classic example of, you know, eat less, move more. They had a piece of asparagus and a lima bean a day, and they're just cranking out cardio all day. And yeah, you lost weight and people in Auschwitz lost weight too. You know, it's like, yeah, fine. You know, that doesn't mean it's healthy. You chop off your leg. You're going to lose weight also. Like, what's your point? You know, it's not, that doesn't mean that that's a good idea. And so they, they measure their metabolism after this and it completely destroyed their metabolism. It was just, it was just bottomed out. 
But then they checked them six years later and they found their metabolisms had never recovered and they'd all regained weight mostly. And some of them, I, I think some of them r retained um, the exercise habits and this is basically eating, you know, uh, you know, grass clippings and, and exercising all the time. And they may have, have kept some of the weight off, but most of them regained the weight um, and none of them um, regained their met metabolic state. They all kept their depressed metabolic state. So that's exactly the opposite of what you want to do. You want to encourage your metabolism. You want to show your body you're not in a famine. You want to eat until fatty meat stops tasting good. You want to lift weights. You want to sprint. You want to go, you don't jog. You go from walking to sprinting. And um, when you can, if you can, or you can do bike sprints on, a, on an exercise bike, like a stationary bike, things like that. But just lift weights and um, and uh, eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Do not limit it. You need fat. It's a it's an essential nutrient. It has essential fatty acids that you have to have or you can get sick and die. There are essential fat soluble nutrients and vitamins um, that you have to have or you can get sick and die. So these are very important things. I mean, vitamin D is a hormone. You know, you need this stuff, and that comes from fatty meat. So if you're doing resistance training five days a week, you're going to put on muscle. And so the weight on the scale may not change all that much. You know, oh my God, I'm, I'm on a weight stall. No, unless your weight's going up, you are losing fat, right? Because if you're, if you're lifting weights to that degree and you're eating enough, you are putting on muscle on a carnivore diet 100%. I'm assuming you're on a carnivore diet because that's why else would you be here, but you didn't say it specifically. So I'm assuming you are. Um, but if you're on a carnivore diet and you're working out five days a week, you are putting on muscle. And so if your weight's not budging much, that's because you're losing fat and you're offsetting it with muscle. I didn't lose, I, I lost 23 pounds in the first two weeks just from dropping greens and eating more meat and eating a lot more meat. I didn't limit, I was already limiting fat and I couldn't lose weight. Then I ate a lot more meat, a lot more fat. And that's when I dropped 23 pounds in 10 days, really. Right. And then I didn't lose anything for six months, right? Because the scale is useless. I was shredding fat and stacking on muscle and I could visibly see that week in and week out. I was getting in better and better shape and feeling better and better too. And I never really cared about what, my, what I weighed. In fact, I wanted to weigh more so I could you know, smash people, right? And have, have more mass to nail people, right? But, um, you know, I didn't lose any weight and I knew why, because I was offsetting the fat I was losing with the muscle I was gaining, right? It was, again, just does away with that whole idea of you, you're either gaining fat and muscle or losing fat and muscle. You can't gain muscle and lose fat. Bullshit. All you have to do is just eat meat and work out and you'll do it uh, straight away. Um, but yeah, you don't need to do that and don't do that. Um, you want to be healthy and uh, just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good, work out and you'll get good results. Just be patient. Just focus on your health and um, you'll do great. Don't worry about it. Uh, do you have any N equals one success stories on stopping chronic kidney disease progression or even some regaining function? Uh, I've got like N equals 97,000. I mean, just look up any sort of uh, Facebook carnivore group like zeroing in on health or zero carb health, and you'll, you'll see literally tens of thousands of people that have done that. Um, and yes, I've, I've, I've personally seen hundreds of people, if not thousands of people that have messaged me, but you know, so, I mean, I don't even know how many of my patients that I've personally tested that have improved their kidney. They all, they all improve kidney function. And, but also this is in the published literature, higher protein diets improve kidney function. That's all there is to it. That's in the published literature. So yes, absolutely. Dark sky. Thank you for the super chat. What if I, or what to do if still having inflammation after six months of pure carnivore, last result treatment, short-term steroids, biologics, or prolonged fasting? Oh, Goodness, it, it depends on what sort of inflammation we're talking about. Are we talking about an autoimmune issue um, or or what? Um, I would probably stay far away from steroids and biologics unless you're having like a really bad flare up. Um, a prolonged, well, doing a fast for a while, what that can do is it can at least say, okay, is there something in the food that you're eating that's uh, tripping this up? And if you just fast for a few days and you find that you're you're improving, okay, then something you were eating maybe was a problem. You need to you need to identify what that was. So pure carnivore is different than a pure 
uh, red meat and water diet. And if it sounds like if you're talking about biologics and steroids, you have an autoimmune issue, then you uh, really have to be on just red meat and water and grass fed and finished red meat and water for best results. So if that's, if that's the case and you have an autoimmune issue and you're eating other things besides just red meat and water, that's what you need to do. You also need to reduce stress. You need to improve sleep. You know, you need to do other things that are healthy for you as well. Um, because stress and those sorts of things can affect that. But, um, you know, if you fast and that helps things, then obviously something you're eating is contributing. If you're eating anything else except red meat and water, get rid of it. Even butter, dairy, you know, electrolytes, artificial sugar, sweetenings, anything. You only eat fatty red meat. You only drink water. You do nothing else. Salt to taste. That's it and see how you go. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this replay of my YouTube Live. If you'd like to catch a live version and ask your own questions, please go to the next scheduled one, usually every Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. All right, see you then, and please enjoy the rest of the Q&A. Atomic, um, thank you for the super chat. Hey Anthony, wondering if diverticulitis uh, can manifest uh, in autoimmune symptoms. I realize some of my main AI symptoms are identical to it. However, I have other symptoms as well, like rheumatoid arthritis and brain fog, emotional problems. Um, I don't know if well, I don't know if diverticulitis will will exacerbate your autoimmune symptoms unless you're having sort of like you know colitis and Crohn's disease. Maybe that can can trip things up. You know, with just sort of with the um, the added sort of inflammatory issues that you're going to have treating the diverticulitis, but, um, you know, potentially, potentially, you know, if you have this infection, you have increased inflammation in your body, this could, this could, uh, trigger, um, this could trigger autoimmunity. It's hard to tell. I mean, the, uh, the main thing is, you know, is it, is it doing that for you? Is this making your RA worse? Is this making your other issues worse? You know, sometimes it's not even just a matter of, of, autoimmunity it's just that you're sick you know diverticulitis is a very serious illness a very serious infection and now you have to take very serious antibiotics to treat it and of course that can make you feel uh not your best and so it could just be a problem with that as well but you know um i think you just sort of see how it affects you and either way you need to treat the diverticulitis you know that that that's life-threatening right so you have to take the antibiotics you have to treat that you have to get that sorted out and then hopefully you can come off of that and then get back to what you're doing and hopefully the rest of your problems uh settle down and uh, good luck with that hope it hope it gets better fmk thank you very much for the super chat for older patients with a longer history of standard american diet or standard australian diet um would it be uh, wise to evaluate bile duct function, HCL production prior to embarking on a high fat eating regime. Not really. You know, your body, your body, uh, it will always be able to digest meat. That's what it's designed for. Um, sometimes it will take a bit of time to, um, for your pancreas to start kicking in and start making more of the enzymes that you need. But I mean, you're talking a couple days. So, uh, no, you know, uh, you, you, unless you're just vegan for 30 years, you know, and you start adding in meat a bit slowly, you could try that. But I mean, I've had, I've interviewed, uh, you know, vegans, they've been vegan for like 21 years plus. And then they went to just straight up, <laughs> straight up just eating meat. And they were like, wow, I've never felt better. So your body will always be able to absorb meat and fat. So no, I don't think you need to do that. Um, but uh, you, you, you know, you can ease into it if you want. If you're a bit worried about it, just you know, you're probably already eating meat, just eat more meat and start reducing less, you know, more and more of the other stuff. And then just, uh, just eating meat. Um, if you are already eating meat and you, you, you know, you haven't stopped that, but you're just eating a mixed diet, you know, you, you're obviously, uh, you know, digesting, absorbing meat because you've been eating it, right? So your body's already used to that. And so I think you can jump right in, but if you're worried about it, you know, just ease into it. That's not a problem at all, but most people do just fine. Um, Mike Oxfalpin. Uh, okay. I don't know how to pronounce that, but hi, Mike. Uh, thank you for the super chat training for OCS to become a uh, Marine officer. Very cool. Currently 140 pounds. What's the best way to bulk on the carnivore diet? Drinking heavy whippy cream and ice shakes. Now, <laughs> uh, you don't need to do that. If you want to gain fat, sure. 
you know, but that's not what you want to do. What you want to do is you want to put on lean body mass. You want to put on muscle. And so that's, that's it. It's just, you, you stimulate your body, uh, to put on lean body mass and uh, healthy lean body mass. And then you, uh, you work out, you just push yourself in the gym, uh, which you're already going to be doing. You're going to, you know, you obviously in, um, officers, um, training, but, um, you know, hit the, you know, do some extra gym sessions, you know, get, you know, more resistance training, lifting weights, things like that. Don't do those stupid heavy weight, low rep sort of things. Go for the 10 to 15 rep range. That's actually better for hypertrophy. And it's definitely better for your joints and, uh, and, um, uh, you know, the health of your joints long-term. So you just lift the weights and you got to eat enough, right? You're going to be doing a lot. You're going to be doing a lot of work. You need to eat enough. You need to eat enough, um, meat and a lot of fat. And if you're in the military, I don't know what your access is, but maybe you, hopefully you've got a bit, uh, bit better access, but you guys got to eat. You just got to eat a lot of meat, a lot of eggs. Uh, if you can handle eggs, um, eggs are great for, for putting on good, uh, bulk and, and, uh, lean body mass, but it's only if you don't react to it and respond to it negatively. So eat as much fatty meat as you're able to every single day, at least, tw at least twice a day, do that. You're going to have to do this after, like if you have morning training or fitness, PT and things like that, you eat straight after that. You give yourself a good five hours before you're doing any sort of big workouts later on. You eat again after that. And so you just have to eat enough. And that's how you, you put on, on uh, lean body mass. It's, it's actually very easy. You're going to put on uh, a lot of, a lot of healthy weight very quickly and um it won't be a problem don't go for the heavy whipping cream and the ice shakes you don't need any of that just eat meat you know you, you'll put on the wrong kind of weight with those other things just eat meat and um and uh, fatty meat and eat until you're done and work out and you just put on a bunch of muscle and uh good luck with it and thank you for the service it's a bit of a scary time bit of crazy stuff going on in the world and um especially uh, in the us there's a lot of weird things happening and uh, so I appreciate you stepping in and uh, and um, helping out the country. So thank you for that. With uh, futures, you look amazing, Doc. I don't know. I still feel I look tired, but thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. Sally, 1985. Thank you for the super chat. And this is, I think we're going to end here, everyone. So this would be the last question. Uh, Sally says, I have no problem quitting carbs at any given time. Uh, I also uh, I also still want to eat carbs on anniversary and holidays. How can I limit the side effects? Um, well, you really can't limit the side effects of um, of eating carbs. You're just gonna you're gonna eat the carbs. You're gonna have the side effects. You're gonna kick yourself out of ketosis. You're gonna get sore. You're gonna depending on the carbs that you're eating, you might get you know muscle soreness and other sorts of issues and not feel great and have other sorts of symptoms you know, that come along with the, the you know, there's grains and seeds and all that sort of stuff that, that's come along with it. You're not going to feel their best. It's probably going to be, you know, you know, four days or so, or maybe up to a week or two that you're not going to feel your best. And, um, and then it's going to take a while for that garbage to get out of your system. It's going to be four or five days before you're in back in ketosis and uh, proper ketosis. And, um, you know, that's just, that's just the, uh, the name of the game. You know, if you drink alcohol, it's going to affect you for a while. Actually, I, I find that just drinking clear spirits one, you know, one day, not even getting, you know, you know, crazy and drunk or anything like that. I'm not hung over the next day. I'm just tired and I don't have great energy and it affects me negatively for the next three weeks. So, you know, there's no real way to mitigate the carbs. You just have to wait for your body to get out of it and get over that shock to your system. And that's pretty much it. And so you have to sort of decide if that is, is worth it to you. If that's, you know, it's not worth it to me. Like I have no interest in having birthday cakes or anything like that. You know, it's nice. I'm fine to watch other people do it. Um, but, uh, I, I just don't want to put that stuff in my body. I mean, it's like saying, you know, when people ask me, it's like, well, do you have any cheat days or anything like that? It's like, no, well, even on your birthday, even on Christmas. And it's just, it's a weird thought to me because these are, these are things that, are really harmful to the body and it makes me feel like garbage and I have no interest in having them. And there are things that people have that same feeling towards and they, they would just never consider having it. And so I put that into perspective and I say, okay, well, do you, do you smoke meth? And they're like, no, God, no. I was like, well, well, even on your birthday, even on a special occasion, well, what about Christmas? You know? And it's just like, you know, if this is something you have no interest in doing, 
then no, you don't want to, you don't want to do it on your birthday either. So this, these aren't things that I'm just like, oh gosh, I just wish I, oh God, I wish I could just have it. And I, and I just hold myself from doing it. Like I have no interest in eating this stuff because I know how bad they are for me. And I have, and I feel very different when I have them. And I just like, no, I don't, I don't want to eat them. I don't want to have them in my body. Um, and so that's the thing. So that's, but if, you know, you haven't gotten there yet and you haven't sort of seen that, you know, you have something on your birthday or something like that and you feel like trash and you just go like, yeah, maybe, you know, I don't want to do this next year, you know, and uh, and you might get there as well. But, you know, if you want to do if you do that occasionally, that's too completely up to you. And uh, and some people do. Um, but uh, you're just going to have to wait it out. You know, it's just it's going to be a little while before it works out of your system and then you get back to where you want to go. And that's, you know, that's, that's it. So it's just that uh, you got to take it on the chin and, um, you know, and that, that's what it is. It's just, you're going to have these negative effects. It's going to take a while for your body to work it out. It will work it out eventually, but you won't feel your best during that time. And there's no real way of mitigating that. It's just the way of mitigating it is to, to not do it or to eat less of it and not do it again. That's the main thing. Your body will get rid of it, but it just takes time. And um, it's you have to ask yourself if it's worth it. To me, it's not worth it. And people say, like, well, you're, you're so, you know, you're so uh, dedicated and de and um, and have so much self control. And I say, no, actually, I, I don't. It doesn't take any dedication or self control to do exactly what you want to do. It takes no self control for me to not shoot heroin. Like it's just like I'm not going to do that. You know, it says, well, what, what, what if someone's there and they just offer it to you? Oh, yeah, no, I, no, I don't want to do that. So that doesn't take any self-control to not do something that I have no interest in doing. And that's exactly what it is for, for the way I eat. This is, this is what I found to be the healthiest way that I can eat. And I feel the best on it as well. So I have just no interest. You know, if other people want to do that, then that's fine. But me personally, I have no interest. And, um, you know, so it's, it's very easy for me to, to not want to do that in those in those situations yeah okay well thank you everyone i hope that was helpful and i hope that was interesting it's always good to see you uh to see you all see everyone as usual it's great that people are coming in more and more people are coming in on x um and facebook now which is great um uh, it's sort of crazy to see all that um that because it used to be like you know two people you were on those and now it's um it's actually quite good so um, but, uh, so yeah, so appreciate everybody coming on and, um, and joining the live. Um, I will be, uh, back for a premiere. Uh, we'll have a premiere of another episode, uh, tomorrow around the same time, but you know, earlier, a few hours earlier and, um, and then uh, another live in two days, um, an hour earlier start from today and, uh, and then another premieres next week. So, um, back schedule. And I try to get things out every day as well with shorts and other other sorts of uh, material, two new things a week, and then sort of shorter clips from my longer episodes because obviously, you know, it's not easy for everyone to see an hour, two hour, three hour interview sometimes. So we take like a 10, 15 minute chunk out of a lot of these things and just put those as, as segments on there that, that people can look at as well. And so hopefully people enjoy that. Um, it'd be great to get feedback on this because, you know, it is posting a lot of content. You know, I repost the lives and things like that to get them out there because that just helps the algorithm. The algorithm sort of puts the live out there for like a week or so, and then it just sort of ignores it and lets it go away. Um, so we repost it as an actual video, which will get, you know, which will, which has, a, a, you know, sort of a better uh, relationship with the algorithm. So, you know, let me know what you guys think, please write in the comments, let, let me know what you think about that and how, uh, I'm sort of structuring the channel, trying to get two, um, shorts out a day and longer for form com, uh, content every day, two new videos, two live, uh, live streams a week. And at least sometimes I do others. Like I did another one this morning as well with, uh, Dr. Uh, Weedman. Uh, who's great, who I'll be having on the channel as well. And um, and uh, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to hear what you, you guys' thoughts are, any thoughts for improving and making things better as well or more interesting for you. Please do let me know. And I'm actually going back on to the, um, to the, uh, the Hard Yarns 
podcast today. Those are those are some guys here in Perth. They're comedians um, and uh, very funny guys. You can look up their YouTube channel. Or, uh, they have YouTube. They have a, a big podcast. It actually, grew quite big. Actually, our first um, podcast together. Uh, well, from what I heard, it actually helped their podcast get become very very popular. So I'm happy that I could have helped with that. Um, and then their Instagram channel and TikTok is uh, the Hard Yarns. And so we'll be on there today. It won't be alive, but we'll record it and it'll probably be posted out um, you know, today or tomorrow in the next few days as well. This will be my third time on with them. They're they're uh, they're really good guys, very funny to talk to. So awesome. Thank you all. Uh, really good to see all of you, and I will see you next time.